The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So let me just start out by giving you a quick uh, overview of what we're going to be doing today, what the, how, what the plan is. Um, I'm going to spend the first maybe third or so of the time, or maybe hopefully less than that, talking very generally about basic camera concepts. And if you have some video experience or if you have some still photography experience, they're going to be pretty familiar to, to you. I'm going to keep it fairly general and we're going to go through fairly quickly some basic things uh, in order to sort of lay the groundwork for the more exciting and interesting part, which is actually going out and, and shooting. Um, so, but after I finish that, then Dave is going to take over and he's going to provide you with a very quick introduction to our camera, uh, where the controls are, how things are set up, how to sort of do some of the, the, the things that I'm talking about specifically with our camera. And then uh, we're all going to go out and have a chance to actually shoot some stuff, which should be a lot of fun. Uh, so that's the story. And uh, I'm just going to jump right in, um, well, although I guess I should ask first, to, does anyone have any questions or thoughts from Wednesday night? Okay. Well, we're, what we're trying to do is, is build uh, every session on the last one. And so I'm going to start out by, by uh, referencing something that, that I talked about last time, sort of the way that we began, which was looking at another visual art, right, painting. And um, if I asked you what the tools and the medium of a, of a painter was, were, uh, you would have a pretty easy answer, right? I mean, it's paint, it's canvas, uh, it's the stuff that you do, use to make a painting. Same with sculpture, you know, stone, steel, mud, bricks, whatever it may be. Uh, so the question then is, what's the medium for film? And what, what are the tools of film? Some are obvious, obviously. The camera, exactly. That's, that's kind of the brush, you know. I mean, not exactly, but, but it's, that's the basic tool. Um, but what else? What are the other tools of the filmmaker? Light. Light. Others? Mm -hmm. So the, the actual, what you record on. Exactly, and how you manipulate that. Um, but there are lots of others as well. And a concept that I find really useful and interesting in just thinking about kind of what you do as a filmmaker or a video maker, and I'm going to use those terms interchangeably, as I said on Wednesday, um, are what we call or can be called the plastic elements of film. And by that, I just mean the elements that you as the artist, the filmmaker, have control over and that you can change. Uh, at will. Uh, so the camera, what you choose to do with the camera is obviously extremely important and in fact central to, uh, to the outcome and to what you want to do as an artist or as a documentarian. Lighting again, whether you're actually adding light, setting up lights, doing very complex lighting setups or just using available light, how you choose to place your subject in relation to the sun, how you choose to light, uh, you know, turn light the uh, uh, lights in a room, these fluorescent lights above us. Uh, we're taping this, this for open courseware, and before everyone came, we tried a couple of different settings uh, for the overhead lights. And so that is, again, a plastic element. Um, but there are others, too. Can you think of others? The lens. The lens. Yeah, I, what, what lens you use to shoot with, exactly. Others? Yeah, exactly. The scene, the setting, uh, could be the location, another way of thinking about it. So if you're doing, and that's obviously true of a fiction film, but it's also true of a documentary. If you're uh, interviewing somebody, where do you choose to put them? And what does where you choose to put them say about your subject? What do you want it to say? You have control over that. Uh, and you have, in a lot of ways, you have as much or as little control as you want because you can uh, be very interventionist and place them exactly where you want them, or you can just sort of 
do whatever happens. You know, if you went to interview a professor here at MIT and you found them in their office, you just could do it right there. And that would say something about them as well. Um, you know, do you clean the office uh, or do you not clean the office? That's another thing. Um, so, so if you think about it like that, then suddenly this whole world of elements opens up, right? Props, how you arrange things in a scene, you know, whether you kind of dress the set. And again, whether it's a documentary or a fiction film, it still, it still applies. Um, sound, how you record the sound, whether you record the sound, what you do in editing in order to uh, change things, if you add music, if you mix the sound, if you add sound effects. Um, and editing itself is a plastic element. That's almost as important as the camera. Uh, it's, it's a central sort of tool for, for the filmmaker, how you edit a piece. So there are any number, and these are just a few, uh, any number of plastic elements that you can control. And I think this is just like a central idea that sort of seems obvious, but it's also something that you want to cont continually remind yourself because uh, I know that in, in, you know, in my experience uh, as a producer or a director and doing a lot of other things in film as well, you, you can sometimes forget that you have the ability to change things. Because sometimes you're rushed, you don't have time, or something kind of, you know, fate deals you a blow that, that you know, you sort of, sort of feel you have to accept. But you just remember that, that, you know, you can take the initiative and change something. So, you know, the location doesn't work, the beautiful idea you had is not gonna, not gonna happen. You improvise and think, think of something else. You have the power to change a lot of these things. Um, so today, we're gonna talk about camera, which is, in many ways, first and foremost, the plastic element. It's the first one that, that was mentioned here when I asked you about what kinds of things you, you use as a tool. And it's sort of, obviously, the fundamental thing because everything is passing through the lens. Um, and I wanna uh, just provide a very, very brief introduction to some of the really basic ideas in uh, filmmaking, which are uh, very similar in many ways to uh, some of the basic ideas in still photography, if you've done that. Uh, and they're, uh, one way to think about them, one way I like to think about them, are as the four Fs. F-stop or exposure, focus, focal length, and framing. Uh, and there are others, but they don't start with F, so I like, you know, I like to start with these. Um, and uh, F-stop is also maybe a bit simplistic when you're talking about exposure. But it's just a way to remember them. F-stop, focus, focal length, framing. And I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes on each one. Uh, and don't expect to sort of absorb it all right now. It's the kind of thing that's gonna make a lot more sense when you're filming. So I'm not gonna get really hung up on a lot of details. This isn't a class on optics or the physics of light or anything like that. But I wanna just introduce a couple of terms. So first, exposure. F-stop or aperture is one of the basic things that controls how, you know, what your exposure of your camera is. And that is basically, uh, in simplistic terms, or sim in simple terms, how much light is entering the camera lens. How much light is hitting the sensor that's recording the image. Uh, and lenses are equipped with an aperture that is adjustable. So you see at the top there, uh, there's an aperture that's very wide, it's very open, which uh, in terms of f-stop is a very low number, f2. Uh, and at the bottom, that very same lens, the aperture is almost completely shut. It's just almost a pinhole, and that corresponds to a very high F number, F, sorry, F22. And lenses, you'll see that the lenses on our cameras can be adjusted. Uh, you can either adjust, leave it in auto and let the camera choose what the exposure should be, or you can choose it. And obviously, uh, the more light you have in a scene, the more stop down or the smaller the aperture would be in order to get the correct exposure. In other words, in order to have enough light hitting your sensor, but not too much light, in order to get a good, a good looking image. Um, just, uh, just also quickly, f-stop is not the only way to adjust exposure. You do have other controls. You have the shutter speed. The shutter speed is basically uh, determining uh, how much time each frame of your video or your film is exposed to light as it goes by. Um, and you can adjust it, but 
in video uh, and film, you n normally aren't going to adjust it. You normally want to keep it for sort of normal appearing motion at about 1 60th of a second. So in practical terms, unless you're shooting something that's a very high speed activity or, or some kind of special situation or you're maybe in, in a very, very low light situation, you don't want to use the shutter as an exposure control. Mainly we're going to keep it at 1 60th. Um, oh yep. Sorry, it's, it's usually double the frame rate. So if it's like, if you're shooting 24 frames per second, it would be uh, 1 over 48, like, you know, 1 over right. 48. And we're shooting 30 frames per second. So, so that's why 60. 1 60, yeah. yeah. Um, the second thing is the camera sensitivity itself. Different cameras have a different sensitivity to light, and you'll very quickly come to uh, both appreciate and hate some of the quirks of our camera. Uh, it is sensitive in, compared to some and not as others. So it depends on what you may be expecting. Um, you can also, however, uh, there, there are adjustments to cameras, uh, and video cameras basically it's called the gain control. So the, if, those, if the light, lighting situation is very poor, you don't have a lot of light, the gain can, can be raised, but the trade-off is that the image gets very, very uh, fuzzy, much lower resolution. Uh, but there is that sensitivity. And then finally, of course, there are lights. Uh, you can add, add light either by changing the location, uh, going from, you know, if the one room is too dark and the next room isn't, you can change the rooms. If you have lights, you can add them. Uh, we actually are, be, uh, if for this class, we're shooting available light for the most part. There will be one class on lighting, but we don't have lighting packages that are gonna be generally available. But there are ways to um, uh, overcome that, uh, clip lights, regular, you know, sort of consumer lights. And people in this class have done interesting things with those, those kinds of things in the past. So anyway, lots of ways to control exposure. The essential basic one is the f-stop or aperture. So let's go on to focus, the second f. Um, first thing to know is that just like with exposure, uh, this camera and almost all video cameras have two settings, auto and manual. Uh, manual focus is almost always preferred because uh, just as with exposure, uh, the auto, uh, setting can be fooled, uh, it will breathe, so you know, like it'll sort of change its mind and focus on something else in the middle of a shot, which can be very distracting and annoying. So in almost all situations, you're gonna, gonna wanna stay manual, both for f-stop and for focus. But you do have that option, you do have auto as a choice, and there are situations, you know, where it's better to be an auto than to be a nothing, right? I mean, if, if you grab the camera because, uh, you know, there's a flying saucer landing outside and you want to get the shot, if it's an auto, it's much better to have something than to have nothing and to, you know, to be adjusting. Um, but generally, we discourage the use of, of uh, autofocus and auto iris. Uh, second thing to think about with focus is um, the depth of field. Depth of field is basically uh, a term that refers to how much of your image in terms of the depth is in focus. So if you're shooting me sitting here talking, as uh, our camera person is, hopefully I'm in focus. The background behind me doesn't have to be in focus. And it might or might not be in focus depending on the aperture that the camera is set at. So uh, a very wide aperture, because it's a low light situation, means that you have very shallow focus. And the background may be out of focus. The, the smaller the aperture gets, the deeper your focus is so that the background suddenly could become in focus. And this is something that you can, it's an aesthetic choice. It's not just sort of determined by uh, your lighting, although that's obviously something you have to deal with. But you can actually make choices about what's in focus and what's not and how deep the focus is. And it, and it, um, and it has an impact on how people read the images that you create. Um, I don't know if anybody here is nearsighted, but if you want to get a sense of how depth of field is determined by the aperture, um, you can take your glasses off and you can actually do this. And the smaller you make the pinhole that you're looking through, the more in focus you are, or the, what you're seeing is. And it doesn't really work if you're, everything's always in focus for you. <laughs> but uh, for me, it works really well. So if I don't have my glasses on in the morning, I can look at you and I can see that you're quite sharp if I make the pinhole small enough. It's, it's, so anyway, it's kind of a cool effect. And it gives you a sense that basically what's happening is that the smaller the, 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 the aperture that the light is passing through, 
the more uh, aligned, and again, I'm not, this is not an optics class, and you know, I'm not gonna go too far down this road that I don't know much about, but the, the light is more, is, is more aligned, there's less scatter, and that makes everything uh, in sharper focus. So again, uh, focus is something that is extremely important, so is, so is exposure. They're sort of non-negotiable. Uh, you know, the first two Fs are either you did it or you didn't. You're either in focus or you're not. And you pretty much want to be in focus and you pretty much want to be pr uh, properly exposed. You don't want to have too much light hitting your image. You don't want to have too little. Um, even if you want to manipulate focus or exposure later um, because you want to actually have things appear out of focus, it's much better to do it in, in editing and post-production than to do it when you're shooting because you can't change it back. You can't make a, a, a blurry image sharp. You can make a sharp image blurry. You can take a, a very well exposed image and make it dark or bright, but you can't very easily take a dark image and make it properly exposed. So these first two, I, as I said, I usually refer to them as the non-negotiable two. Um, the next two, however, um, are infinitely negotiable. Uh, focal length uh, refers to uh, whether you're shooting something in a wide angle or a telephoto or a normal setting. And again, you may have you know, some experience with this with still photography. Wide angle lens are the, num the lenses that are a smaller number of millimeters, you know, like, like the 12 millimeter, millimeter lens, the six millimeter lens, uh, you know, the 16 millimeter lens. Telephoto are the big numbers, 200, 300, 150. Um, and each of them uh, give you very, very, very different feeling uh, kinds of images. Uh, the wide angle lens gives you a much wider angle of view, obviously. So uh, if you're filming landscapes, uh, you could put a wide angle lens on your camera and from the same position, get a much wider field. Uh, it also gives you much deeper focus uh, to go back to the idea of, of depth of field. With a wide angle lens, it's much easier to get everything in focus from the foreground to the background. Telephoto lenses, on the, on the other hand, are a much narrower angle of view. So if I'm standing in the same place filming the same thing, I'm seeing a much narrower field, um, which it can also be thought of as magnification, right? So same image, but now if I'm filming the camera person who's filming me, I'm seeing just his face instead of the whole, the whole field. Uh, and the focus, the depth of field is much shallower. So it's much easier to get a nice soft background on a telephoto lens. Um, just one, one other note about focal length. Again, it's, it's something that is infinitely uh, variable and you can choose as a filmmaker what kinds of uh, focal lengths you use. But don't confuse a wide angle lens with a wide shot or a telephoto lens with a close up. It's easier to get a close up with a telephoto lens and it's easier to get a wide shot with a wide angle lens but it's certainly possible to do uh, a wide shot with a telephoto lens. You just have to be much farther away from your subject and vice versa, it's, much, it's very possible to do a close up with a wide angle lens. You just have to get much closer. But, but they'll feel very, very different. And um, I'll show you some extreme examples in a, here in a minute. So this is an extreme wide angle lens, uh, what's, what we call a fisheye lens. And you'll see, you know, first of all, that, that it's very distorted, but you're seeing a very, very wide field of view. So wide, in fact, that, that the only way to accommodate it is the distortion. Uh, you're also seeing incredible depth of field. The background, the infinite distance is, is sharp, and so is the hand that's not that far away from the, from the camera. It also, uh, wide angle lenses, and this is an extreme example, wide angle lenses tend to distort and elongate the distance between objects. So that hand is much closer to the camera than it might appear, and the distance between the hand and, and you know, every other element going back is somewhat elongated. So uh, it makes small rooms feel much bigger. Uh, it makes distances seem much greater. Telephoto lens, which, you know, the long lens, because they're long, do the opposite. So here we have uh, a telephoto shot of a, of, a, of a bird. And you see, first of all, that the background is, is very, very soft, even though it's not that far, you know, really behind the bird. Uh, and things are very compressed. So the distance between the bird and the background it feels like you know, there's not much distance at all, even though there might actually be quite a lot. 
Um, one of the things about telephoto lenses is that sometimes the, the depth of field is so shallow that you can literally have, uh, you know, like the eye of the bird in focus and, uh, you know, the, the background that, you know, of the, the plant that it's standing on completely soft. Here you, the plant is actually in focus. Um, but if you're doing an interview, like the, a, a, a human eye might be in focus and their ear might be out of focus at, a, at an extreme telephoto uh, lens. So this is actually, you know, aesthetically really pleasing because the foreground jumps out at you. You know, our eye goes immediately to the bird and the background just drops off into this very soft, nice kind of, kind of uh, back plate. So uh, again, I could shoot a wide shot like this, but it would look extremely different than shooting a wide shot with a, with a wide angle lens. So now let's talk about framing. Um, and framing, this is, this is really, you know, once you sort of master the basics of the camera, framing is kind of a catch-all term for sort of everything else, <laughs> you know, about how you choose to shoot things. Uh, you know, do you choose to shoot close-ups? Do you shoot, choose to shoot wide shots? What's the grammar of film? And we're not going to uh, do any kind of exhaustive um, talk about that right now, um, but it's an infinitely sort of uh, interesting and uh, inexhaustible subject. Um, Sabrina, you mentioned, you know, that, that uh, on Wednesday night when we were looking at those very early films, everything was filmed head to toe. And that was because, I mean, there really hadn't been a grammar of film developed at that point. They were just thinking about them as stage plays. So people would walk in head to toe and they'd do their thing and they'd walk out. Um, but, you know, a few years after that, people started filming close-ups. And that was a huge uh, revolution. They started filming shots of the hands of people doing things. They started moving the camera so that it would pan from one person to another and back. They started filming shots with someone in the foreground and someone in the background. And then they'd do a reverse with this person in the foreground and this person in the background. And, and that kind of opened up this whole language that all of us, you know, we're, we're used to reading this language because we've been doing it our entire lives. But at that point, it was extremely new. You know, what shot works with this shot? What's confusing? What's not confusing? How do we understand a scene? And all of that is, is uh, related to framing. So uh, we're going to be looking at a lot of films in this class. We're going to be talking about why they were shot the way they were shot, uh, both in terms of the sort of the social terms uh, and the, the technical terms, the technological terms, but also in terms of the framing and the grammar of them. And uh, it's something that uh, you're going to gain a lot of experience and understanding of as you as you make your own films. Um, but just for starters, um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just some basic kind of ideas and concepts that you might want to think about as as you as you frame a scene. Um, let's take this class, for instance. Uh, how would I film this class? There are an infinite number of ways that I could do it. It's being filmed right now for a very particular reason, a very particular purpose. Open Courseware is filming it. And the way they're filming it is by focusing on me, because I'm the one talking, and on the slides, because it's information that they're trying to capture. Uh, if we were filming it for other purposes, we could have a completely different approach. We could film it uh, as a a documentary cinema verite, direct cinema style, which is, if you remember the, the, the scene, uh, the John F. Kennedy documentary about uh, the primary in Wisconsin that we watched the clip of on Wednesday night, uh, that was all about the experience of being there. And it had a very particular point of view, the experience of uh, Jackie Kennedy and JFK in that room, shaking a million hands, being kind of pushed by the crowd. So. If we were going to film this class in that way, we could use a handheld camera. The camera could be completely mobile. You could be, barely, you know, if I'm not what's important to the filmmaker, I could, I might barely be in it. You know, maybe it's a, a film about you, and they're following you in your day, and I'm just this sort of droning voice in the background. What they're interested in is your response to the environment, and how to capture that. So. It'd be a completely different, uh, completely different uh, way of filming this, and the framing and the shot choices would be completely different than what we're doing right now. Um, 
we could film it with multiple cameras. We could film, you know, as we did the other night. We could have, have a camera that, you know, pointing at the students, camera in the background. We could edit it together. Um, what, how, how we, you know, how we shoot people, whether we're shooting them in close-ups or wide shots, all has a really significant impact on the story that we're telling. And uh, one of the things with documentary film is that you're, you, as, a, as a camera person, like again, let's say that, that we're doing you know, A Day in the Life of Sabrina, um, as, the, uh, as the story unfolds, we're constantly making adjustments, we're constantly making new choices about what to film. So uh, if we're filming your experience of being in this class, as that experience changes as a camera person, you, you would, you know, the camera person would need to be sensitive to that change. So, uh, you know, let's say you got in, into a, a, a discussion and a disagreement with Dave, our TA, you know, because you didn't agree with his interpretation of something, um, which will happen. No, I won't. <laughs> no, I won't. Um, so suddenly we, we would be focusing on Dave and your response to Dave. So, you know, we would be in close-ups on you, look, listening to Dave, looking unhappy, arguing back, suddenly we're on Dave, Dave is talking, back and forth, back and forth. And you know, me, the instructor who's being filmed right now, I'm not even in the picture. It doesn't matter what, I, what I'm saying or thinking or doing. You know, that maybe then you know, we're, the camera person starts looking for close-up reaction shots of other students. You know, does everyone agree with you? Or does everyone agree with Dave and think you're wrong? You know, and, and, as, and, and as you make that choice as a camera person, it's gonna impact who you choose to film. So, um, you know, we went, we, we, we touched on the idea of fairness and accuracy in the documentary film. You know, what you choose to frame and how you choose to frame it has a huge, huge impact on the story that you tell. So, you can walk into that situation I just described and film it with an agenda like, you know, we want to make Sabrina look like the smartest person in the room. So then you film it in a certain way. Or, you know, we want to just, we want to show how, you know, how completely isolated she is. Film it in, in a different way. Uh, or you could be very sensitive and open to the, the situation and adjust and try to be, make an accurate or fair representation of what's actually happening. And believe me, that's, that both are common in, in documentary film. I mean, going in with an agenda is extremely common. And that's not the same as, you know, lying, quote unquote, manipulating, although there is an element of manipulation to it. Uh, but, but generally, we do go in with pre preconceived notions, and it impacts how we, how we frame things and how we shoot things. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the overall thing. We're not going to talk about a lot of film grammar right now, because I could go on for the rest of the time, and I'd rather get on to the actual camera work. Um, but I am going to, I am going to uh, just raise a couple of things to think about, since you'll very soon have cameras in your hands. And um, you know, just, just basic kind of, kinds of things to think about as you choose the shots that, you, that you're going um, to film. Um, first of all, there's a real tendency when you get a camera the first, you know, for the first time, and I mean, I'm, you, I'm sure everyone at this point has filmed something you know, with a video camera. Um, there's a real tendency to want to capture everything. Right, so we're we're in this room, we're filming, and you sort of think like, oh, I'm going to get everything, and you start doing this, which is basically moving continually because that's how we our eyes work, right? You know, I'm I'm just looking around, I see everything, so you just assume the camera works that way too, but what you end up doing is capturing nothing because with the camera you have to you have to sort of fake the way your eye works. And the way your eye works is I'm, at, I'm, really, I'm doing this and I'm seeing everything, but I'm also continuously, you know, my brain is continuously picking out things and making close-ups out of the stuff that I see, making different angles. So when I was talking about you, suddenly there was a close-up of you, even though I saw everything else too. Um, when I talked about Dave, suddenly there was a close-up of Dave in my head, right? So the camera has to do that, and you have to make it do that. Which means that you know what what they call hosing down the room, which is this kind of continual sort of well I don't want to you know I don't want to miss anything so I'm just going to keep doing this. It just ends up with with mush and and you're not telling a story and you're not really getting any shots that you're able to edit. So you know you want to be deliberate about what you're shooting and you want to think about what you're shooting. You know what story am I telling, and what what images do I need to tell that story? You know do I need to focus on 
on you? Do I need to focus on Dave? Do I need to shoot a wide shot that establishes the geography of the room so that I know where people are sitting? Um, second thing uh, is, very basic thing, hold your shots. Um, you know, there's also a tendency that goes along with this, this hosing down the room to never really hold on anything. So uh, I'm filming Sabrina, but then suddenly I want to go over here, and then I want to go back, and then I end up with nothing again. Uh, so you you know you want to you want to uh, make a choice and then stick with it for long enough that you actually get something. So if I'm shooting a close up of Chris listening to me skeptically, <laughs> I want to hold on for a no certain number of seconds and then go back to the next thing that I want to shoot. And it can be hard sometimes because you know suddenly something really interesting is happening over there and you want to run over and get it, and you need to be responsive to that and, and obviously pay attention to it, but if you get sort of too caught up in the moment, you end up with nothing. And, and this is something that is a real struggle even for professional camera people sometimes because they, they have all of this sort of information bombarding them about what they want to do. And they, some of them, especially people who come from still photography, maybe don't hold the shots long enough. Uh, you know, there's kind of a rule of, you know, like the nice long slow count to 10 before you then pan away to something else. Could be a count to five if the action is a little faster. Um, but just remember, you know, frame something up, hold the shot, and then move on. Um, and then, you know, the idea also when you're moving the camera is, is think about why you're moving the camera. Uh, why, would you move it, why would you move the camera rather than just to hose down the room? Okay, any basic ideas? Well, like if, no, if I'm moving, if I, if, I, if, if I have a camera, why would I actually start doing this? Why would I actually move? Well, compared to, compared to um, just moving like this randomly or not moving at all, you know, what would motivate me to move the camera around? Like talking to somebody in Right, yep, exactly. So following an action, and it might be an actually a physical action. I mean, if I'm, if I'm profiling Chris and suddenly she gets up and goes over and, you know, to, to like, you know, really get in Dave's face to really argue with him, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'd want to follow that, right? But if they're just talking, even cordially, I don't know why I always bring you into conflict, Dave. I don't know. Uh, I that's, apologize. I don't. That's just who I am. Um, <laughs> yeah, you just draw. You know, you just draw it out of people. Yeah. But, um, but you know, even if, even if they're just they're speaking, as you say, I'm, I would be panning back and forth, and at some point I might come over here and film Dave, and start filming from his point of view. So. That's the, you know, that's the situation. Uh, you, tr you, try to, you want to try to make your moves motivated by something, not just by kind of random hosing down of the room. So that's, again, just a really basic concept. And it, all of this is, you know, it's going to make a lot more sense when you start shooting, and it's really going to make sense when you start editing. Because editing is the part where you really learn how to shoot. I think all people who shoot should edit, even if they don't want to be editors, because that's when you really learn what's working and what's not working when you're shooting. A um, couple of other uh, quick tips. Uh, remember that although film is a two-dimensional art form and your images are all 2D, you're, you're representing a 3D world. And that means that you want to think about ways to create depth in your frame, uh, which means essentially different planes of action. Um, so again, if I'm filming Chris and Dave, if I come around like this and I shoot Chris's shoulder in the foreground and Dave in the far background, that's kind of a nice deep shot because we're, we get a sense of the room, we get a sense that there's depth, that there's kind of a, th a dimensionality to, to the conversation. And then I can go over and I can do the same this way. You know, I also might still shoot close-ups and edit it all together, um, but you know, what would be kind of weird and, and disorienting would be is, again, if they're having a conversation and I just filmed the close-up of Chris, and then I went over and I filmed the close-up of Dave, and I never had any sense of, like, the relationship in space or what the room was like or anything else. Because then you would just have this sort of head floating in space over here, head floating in space over there, with no kind of relationship between them and no kind of three-dimensionality. So, again, 
using depth of field, using, even if something's out of focus in the background or in the foreground, you know, you, you, you could also have the foreground be out of focus. So, you know, if, I, if there was something on this computer that was really, really interesting and I wanted to have Dave as well, I could have this be out of focus and Dave in focus. It doesn't have to be that the foreground is the, one, the thing that's in focus. Um, and then the last tip, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dave. And again, I understand that this is all kind of, you know, abstract at this point, but it's just kind of I want to put, put some ideas out there that will hopefully kind of inform uh, some of the shot choices that you'll make, be making later. Um, but the last thing I want to mention is framing in terms of centering things or not centering things. Um, we tend to think, put things off center. This is uh, an interview that we did uh, with Joel Dawson, a professor in electrical engineering here. It's kind of dark on the screen, but um, you see that he's off, off center. And there's a lot of negative space on the left, which is where he's looking. And that tends to be, and, I, and I'm talking about sort of very conventional kinds of, kinds, of, kinds of filming, that tends to be something that's a little more pleasing because it gives this, the, the, uh, the frame some more energy. Uh, psychologically, I'm not exactly sure why that's true, but it might be that it, there's sort of space for him to potentially move into rather than being lined up right in the center of the frame. So, there's, so there, he's looking kind of into space that he could sort of potentially occupy. Also, just as an aside, notice that the background is, is very, very soft. It's, it's shot with a, quite a long lens, uh, which is nice because you know, the, the interview subject pops out, number one. And also number two, it was this very, very uh, unattractive lab. And it just goes away. It's very nice. Um, the other thing about, about uh, filming things off center like this is that uh, you, you want to think about, in terms of framing, and this is, again, kind of classic composition, um, think about your frame in thirds. Uh, the, 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 the third dividing lines, were, you know, if you take a, a line and, and divide it vertically in thirds, and then there's one line missing here, but horizontally in thirds, the intersections of the lines tend to be kind of powerful places in the frame. And you notice here, again, it's a very kind of classic kind of framing. His eye lines up exactly with one of those third places, one of those intersections. Um, that's why when you have close-ups of people in movies and it gets really, really close, they tend to chop the top of the head off because they're keeping the eye line roughly in the top third of the frame. You notice, again, he's centered this way, so there's a lot of negative space over there. Could, you could just as easily put him over here, looking kind of this way into the negative space, and his eye could be lined up with that. Um, if it was a wider shot, like a very wide shot, maybe a head-to-body shot, and we saw the entire frame, you know, you would probably, if again, if it was classic, uh, classic framing, his head would end up being kind of in one of these third spaces as well. So, you know, imagine a whole body with a head here or here. And if they were walking and you were panning with them, you know, if he was walking this way, you would probably frame him up kind of on that line with his head there, which would give him plenty of space to walk into. And then you would continue to pan with him, always giving more space here, which, because again, that gives you kind of this, this energetic frame in the sense that the person's walking and you're following. So that's the very, very kind of quick tour of some things to think about when you frame and, and choose shots. And we will be spending a lot of time on this in, this in this class. So don't think that you know. You needed to sort of absorb it all right now. But um, go ahead. And one other thing I see you're doing is that having some videos here. Because I was just thinking yeah. in the future, it becomes a chance then that after you've been playing around with the camera, at some point you can go back and say, OK, let's do this. Let's take off a little bit of footage. So it makes right. more sense afterwards. Right. This will, this will make the most sense when you've, as I said, not only done some shooting, but also done some editing. And um, you know, between now and then, we will definitely be going back to talk more about film language and film grammar and the shot, kinds of shots that cut together and the kinds of shots that don't cut together. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dave in just a minute, um, but I want to say one last word about formats. Uh, so formats in video are proliferating like crazy. There are an endless number of, of HD, uh, and SD, but at this point primarily HD high definition formats. The one we're filming in, or using in this class is HDV 1080i 1440 by 1080 
which is basically a compressed version of full HD, which is 1920 by 1080. And you may know something about what those things mean. You may know nothing about what they mean. But I want you to kind of write them down, and you'll absorb them later, uh, if that makes sense. Basically, um, 1920 by 1080 refers to the size of the frame. It's 1,920 pixels wide by 1,080 pixels high, which, again, if we go back to this frame, that gives you basically that aspect ratio. So, you know, it's wider than it is high. And that's, you know, 16 by 9 televisions as opposed to standard definition square televisions. Um, our data rate is 25 megabits per second, uh, and that boils down to approximately more or less 10 gigabits, gigabytes per hour. And what that means, obviously, is that the file sizes are very, very large. There's a lot of data. Uh, the camera's capturing a lot of data. The, the computer you edit on is expected to process a lot of data. And one of the things that we will be talking about later in the class is how you know, the IT revolution has really enabled video documentaries and completely changed the game and enabled things like this class to happen. The um, point here is mainly just so that you're kind of aware of the format that, that these cameras shoot and uh, what the file sizes are, are going to be. That's also why we give each of you a hard drive, so that you don't have to you know, worry about how you're going to store a terabyte worth of material on your own. So uh, any quick questions before I turn it over to Dave? The, yeah, it's basically squeezed, uh, but you never see it squeezed. They, it actually then gets uncompressed automatically when it's viewed. Well, we see that 1920. Yes. Oh. Yeah, you see the same. It looks like 1920 by 1080. And the reason that they compress it like that is to save, uh, save space. So the 25 megabits per second data rate is very, very low for high definition you know, video. Uh, most, most data rates are higher than that, like 35, 50, 55 or for a completely uncompressed HD, really, I forget, it's really, really high. Um, so, so it's just a strategy for, for giving less data, but still having a nice HD image. Yeah, you never actually see that, unless you make a mistake in Final Cut, which we'll, we can talk about later. And just one word about why we're using tape in this era of cards and files. Um, one reason is that the cameras are a couple of years old, but, but there's actually another reason too, which is that this provides a very cheap and easy backup for you. Uh, file management, as wonderful as cards are and as, as much as it speeds the process, and I'm a big fan of them, uh, in a student situation, if you want to do cheap backups, there's, you know, tape is, is great. You can stick them in your sock drawer and yeah, not exactly. have to worry about your hard drive crashing or something. Yeah.